Hello and welcome to the wisdomfactory.net. I'm Heidi Hörnlein, I'm living in Italy and I've created this as a platform to talk with people about very interesting things. And today we want to talk about how purple is living on in the US. And my guest today is Heather McDowell. And I met her on the Integral African Conference last June in Johannesburg. And I'm very glad that you are here joining me and we will explore this topic because in Africa we have learned a lot about purple and let's see how it is in America. But before we dive into the topic, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you are interested in, and so on. Well, hi, Heidi. Thanks so much for having me. This It seems sort of like a dream come true after interloping, I would say, at the Integral Conference. I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm not... Um, I'm, I'm deeply interested in your Integral and Spiral Dynamics space, but I truly am an interloper. I've, I've read about it. I've seen it happen in corporate life. I've seen it happen in my own personal life. And I just have a deep interest, but I, I guess I would caveat all of this with these are sort of my, my own observations and they're certainly not based so much on academic study as you and, and others in the space would have it. I'm, I'm from, I, I work in Montana. I'm from Montana. If anyone knows about Montana, they think of cowboys and horses and mountains. And I really, I really grew up the quintessential Montanan. And I am so happy to have, to have found Spiral Dynamics because I really have the most purple family. And I think I always tried to attribute it to something else maybe, maybe more geographic or demographic or personality type maybe more so than worldview. But now that I understand the purple worldview, it's just a, a really beautiful purple. My people are very um, tribalistic in a good way. They're very patriarch centered. Um, my father is like the Marlboro man without the cigarettes. He's a cowboy through and through, he spends most of his time on his horse, even at the age of 73. And um, just a very, a very purple setting where the family is centered around the patriarch and we live off of the land. My family has a cattle ranch. And my father told me from early on, you can you know, go forth and be bold, conquer the world. You can do anything you want to do, just don't be a damn lawyer. So <laughs> I am not a purple person. <laughs> I don't think I ever was very purple. And I think it's so interesting to now see this play out because I said, okay, great. I have no idea what lawyers do, but I think that's what I'll be. <laughs> and so that's what I became. And most, I think, parents in the U.S. who's now, I'm... It's even worse now because I'm married to a doctor. So that's the real tragedy for my cowboy father is that he spawned a lawyer married to a doctor. And I think, you know, there's to most families, to most blue families or really maybe any other color, that would be great, right? But to my family, it's this, it's like a huge disappointment. It's, it's, um, almost kind of offensive. I mean, I know deep down they're very proud not being able to understand why I would want to leave the tribe and why I would want to go off and, and do something that's not at all purple. So I think it's, it's just been interesting to watch purple play out in rural America. I mean, I think Others have probably studied this more in the academic setting, but my observation is that that's why we have the president that we do. It's um, they're rural Montana and they're rural America, and there's a lot of rural America. I think really is very purple. I think it probably matches the 65% of the rest of the world. And it looks for a patriarch. It looks for someone who's going to protect the tribe. And I, I think that that's what's happened. I mean, they're great people. Like my, my family is, um, 
just they're wonderful human beings who are very generous and um, giving and you know but but they're purple so I think that's kind of a, a summary of, of what I find very interesting about the purple culture that is alive and well in the US. That's totally interesting to me because I've never thought about it I mean we always think our Western societies, we are at least in red and your present uh, president, I have coordinated with red and, mm -hmm. um, and then blue. Yeah, many, we know that even here in Europe, we are very much centered still in blue, but that there is purple. I would like you to, to, to tell a little bit more how life goes on in purple. Um, you, you already said it as a patriarch. I mean, when I think about our stereotypes of Indian uh, uh, tribes, you know, where the, the head uh, person and then they are sitting in a round and uh, in a council and decide things together, but there's always the, the, the chief, let's say. Is it like this or uh, how, is, how is it? How is life going on? I mean, not only in the family, but also in the in the community where you grow up. And that's one question. The other one where I'm very much interested in, but maybe we do it later, is how did you get out of it? Because normally you say this environment is deciding or yeah, is, is the cause where what you can reach in your development. So very interesting, both of it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's really family centered. I think that the patriarch, I mean, I'll just give you a, a for instance, in, in my family, we worked on the ranch and I still, when I'm not being a corporate lawyer, I go and, and help and work on the ranch. And it's very much sort of serving my father, you know, making sure that we help him if we're driving around, I stop and I get out and get the gates for him and I, you know, sort of circle around and see what else I can do to help him with. And we're all very focused on making sure that we're relieving as much of his duties or his responsibilities as we can. And my mother, for instance, is just incredibly capable, but she will cook three meals a day for my father and then go work side by side with him, physically laboring on the ranch. And that's sort of the, the mentality that I think women, you know, agricultural women have is that they'll put food on the table and they'll go work side by side. And I mean, there's a lot of really great things about it. I think that the work ethic and the family bonds that it creates when you're doing when you're, you know, you're doing a career together, it would be like other professionals taking their children to work and having the children actively engaged in seeing how they can lessen the parents' duties or, you know, trying to make the parents um, work life better. And it's this really great system of kind of service. Um, and I think if you see it for that, I mean, it's, um, I think that there is a lot of the U.S. that a lot of people wouldn't see. If you're traveling internationally, you're not going to see the place that I, I grew up. You wouldn't know how to get there. It would be like, you know, your, it would be like me going to rural Germany and finding a place, you know, that people, where people are immersed in agriculture. I would, could never really see what they were doing and understand it because I wouldn't understand the language. I couldn't find the place. And I think that's sort of what happens in the US. People really have this iconic image of rural America. And I think it's really still out there. And there's lots of really wonderful things about it. Um, but I, I think the next question of how, how do you get out of that? That's the thing that I'm really interested in studying because I think it's um, great for me to reflect on it. And I have, I have gained so much and I have such an advantage in life by growing up in purple where we all work together 
I think any job that I do will be easier than that. It's um, just a like a backbone that I have and a, people in the US like to use the term grit these days. And I, I don't know if, you know, if that's, that's something you're familiar with, Heidi, but definitely I have grit because of how I grew up, no doubt. But I think then the question of, well, what if you wanted to do something else and not be purple? I think it, it gets more complicated because, you know, you to do a lot of things, you wouldn't necessarily have family support. So I think that's the area that I'm really interested in looking at. I mean, I came from an educated family where there was an expectation that I would also become educated. It was the hope that I would then also come back to the ranch. But I guess I'm really curious and want to study more. What about purple people who are in maybe more true poverty and who don't necessarily have the education opportunities and maybe they're really not purple, but they're stuck in purple forever. And I, I just wonder what we do about them. Mm -hmm. And where would you find them? Um, are these the, the workers maybe on the ranch or, or, or people who, I don't know, where do they live? In the cities? Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I mean, if I think about it sort of on the rural setting, if you're looking at rural America, I think there are a lot of people who just don't ever come into contact with someone who lets them see a world other than purple. You know, that I think that not always, but often women have kind of a, a secondary place. And I think that um, it's just very common that women would have children and stay home and take care of them. And I think you might just find households of people who have grown up in in purple maybe without the knowledge that there's some that there's something else out there mm -hmm. and uh, the television is everywhere do, do, aren't they influenced by the television mm -hmm. or I, I don't know how the programs are in america are they low quality so that they won't see anything mm -hmm. uh, which could get them out uh, into higher stages of development? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that now um, internet connection, TV, all that, I mean, it's everywhere. And I think it's a huge, I think the real challenge comes when if the child, the you know, child who grew up purple wants to do something else, I think the hard part is, is getting family support. You know, it's, it's kind of that the, the child would go off and have to go it alone, maybe either financially or just from a support system. I, I know, I mean, it's not as if my family didn't support me going to law school, but they weren't really thrilled. I mean, my father especially wasn't really thrilled about it. Um, and I think if you look at other, you know, if you, I think that that might be the hard part if you're actually looking at ones in true poverty, how do they get out and get supported to go do something else? Because then I think the other thing is that if the child were to go do something else and be successful, I think then the expectation from a patriarch standpoint is that they would take care of the family. So then they're kind of stuck back in caring for the family and you know, I, I guess I don't know the answer to it. I, this is really nothing other than a theory that I've observed, and I think it would be really interesting to find out if the data matches the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. What I hear you say is that your family was maybe not completely purple, because when your, your father allows you, even if he doesn't like it, but he is not as patriarchal as to say, no, you don't go to school. So he mm -hmm. was yeah. already more open in his mindset uh, and allowing at least you to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get interested in it? Just as an opposition to your father who said, you don't, don't go to law school and you said, oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, really, I really think that that was it. And then I started just kind of, you know, looking into it. That will gosh, it sounds like fun. You could argue with people all day. That's great. I'm, I'm well prepared for that, right? So I just, um, I think I was a little bit, always a little bit contrarian. And I think the idea of 
having a career and being contrarian appealed to me. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> amazing. So how was your, um, your life then? You grew up until when did you stay there? Was, were there secondary schools, colleges nearby? Or did you have to go yeah. further away? Yeah, so I went to a, a, a small um, elementary school at one time. There were nine in my class, so, so very small. In my graduating high school class, there were 18, and four were actually foreign exchange students. You know, God help the, the poor kids who came thinking they were coming to the U.S. to go to New York or L.A., and they ended up in Montana. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, and then I... I actually, I rodeoed, so I participated in rodeos. I roped and what you is, know, did what rodeo is a, events. What, what is rodeo? A rodeo is like where you go rope calves and you go do speed events on horses. Um, you go, you know, it's like a timed, you would do a timed event um, running your horse. I did barrel racing and so you had barrels set up and ran around the barrels and tried to be faster than everyone else on your horse. I also roped and so that's that was kind of my life and I was really passionate about it. And when I went to college, I really went so that I could go and participate in rodeo. And at the time, you know, I had this notion I wanted to be a lawyer, but I, I was really interested in I had a rodeo scholarship and I was on the rodeo team. And so I always kind of had a, I didn't really have a, a clear view of the world. I don't, you know, other than through this lens of other people who were very much like me, even in college. And then I kind of just, then I, I applied for law schools and um, went off to law school. And that was really the first time that I wasn't surrounded by people just like me. And how was that then? It was fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was sort of, it was definitely life changing. I mean, every, most people I know hated law school, but I loved it because it was the first time where I had really been able to focus on anything academic, where I had other people around me and we were interested in academic topics. And we talked about that instead of purple topics like agriculture and, um, you know, our rodeo events and things like that. So it was just, I think it happened a little bit later in life for me than some who would have that experience in high school or college. Mm -hmm. And then you obviously took all the time and the money to go over to South Africa to an integral conference. So how did you get interested into that? And how did you meet integral or spinal dynamic thoughts. How, how did that happen? Yeah, so I've been, a, I've been a corporate lawyer for a long time, about, oh, I guess about 10 years now. And I've always been really interested in psychometrics, as now I know that the field is called. But I've participated in a couple of different leadership things early on in my career and just thought it's so insightful that, yes, this person seems crazy, but really they're just personality type X. They're not crazy, you know, or so-and-so seems difficult to deal with. And I think as a lawyer, one isn't really given much training in that space. I mean, it's pretty academic training. Then you go to work and you're doing, you know, boatloads of work, never really thinking about the sort of softer skills side of it. So only in the corporate world, I got exposed to the psychometrics piece and just found it fascinating that it explained so many things about people's motivations. And then um, when I came, I, I'm a uh, lawyer here at um, Sabani Stillwater in Montana. And so we have a South African parent and we work with Rika who's does consulting for our executive team here and uses the psychometrics and it just i think that i was really well versed in the mbti and sort of the the personality type the innate um difference what you're driven by and those type of psych psychometrics but i really think the spiral sort of turned on a light that okay it's not just your sort of personality traits that seem fairly static 
but it's this kind of um, more movable and uh, more malleable worldview that really make because you can have the same personality type as someone and and have a very different outlook on the world. And I think that the the spiral in the corporate setting and in the personal setting, it really is that extra layer that explains why people are the way they are. And, and really, I think happy, right? I mean, <laughs> how do you define happy? But so that people can really find meaning, I think the worldview is really the, the light bulb. So, so I was, I, I mean, I happened to be in, in Joburg for work and it intersected with some work that Rika and I were doing. And I just thought this is like the opportunity of a lifetime to be an interloper with psychology academics on this topic. And it was, it was um, so fascinating. Yeah, the, the experience I think of everybody is when you come into contact with a spiral and got, get to understand it, that's like psh, opening up your mind. Because before you think, for instance, I, in, in private, I, I talk with people who say, but your president is stupid and I don't know what, you know. But I say, these are worldviews. That's not, people just cannot see other things when they are in a, in a certain world, worldview stuck. They cannot see um, what, what people can see when they have gone ahead in the spiral. So you don't need to dismiss people on, on that because, you know, sure, when they have an a, um, a important uh, task in the world, it would be better to have leaders of a higher worldview. But not just uh, dismiss people as, as stupid or as, as uh, mm -hmm. uh, negative, mm -hmm. or how can I say that? Dismiss them as, as a human being. That's not right, because they, as you said before, they are not crazy. In their mm -hmm. worldview, they are doing the best thing they can do, only maybe in yours not, you know. And this is, I think, if we all could come to this understanding, we wouldn't have these discussions as we have now and these clashes. Mm -hmm. But we could understand each other and then try to find a way to, to navigate the conflicts. And now what we are doing is polarization and war and I don't know what. So... Uh, I'm wondering how, for you, this understanding is. How do you see your your country from this view of spinal dynamics? Um, what is what, what is happening? What is going on? Maybe politically, but also socially in in, in you know in, in in the whole field. So I mean, I really do see this purple clash with the greens and the blues. I mean, especially the blues. Maybe there's a little green, I maybe giving people more credit than they deserve. But it's really the blues judging the purples. I mean, the blues who are who are more educated, who are, you know, on paper, who are more intelligent, who are and, and it's just not how it is. I mean, I would put the purples up against the blues any day. But the purple's views are really being lost. I mean, a lot of people in the U.S. make their living off the land. They, um, you know, they are purple. They're they're happy. Pur I mean, they find meaning in being pur purple. I don't know that. I just don't know that we should go trying to change all of our purples. But I think then you have this crush of blue who who seems elitist and. Um, I think the purples, I mean, I, I understand why we have the president that we do. I mean, I don't, I think we have a lot of good people who are purple and they feel like they have no choice. You know, the, the other choice um, is to be judged by blue and, you know, that's, that's not for them. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's just really, um, I don't know what the word is here. I mean, I, I don't want to want you to think we've all given up hope, but it um, is a really disappointing situation here because it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, I think that 
I've been joking for years, I'm going to start the normal party for normal people. You know, I don't give a damn, I don't give a damn who you marry, don't take all my money. Um, and I just think that so many people in the US are at least socially accepting. I think a fair amount these days are pretty socially liberal and, you know, relatively fiscally conservative. I mean, they are not yet prepared to go on the European system of, of really funding a lot of things that maybe that's where we will go eventually. But I, I do think a lot of people are, are around that mean. They're not, I mean, I feel like now we're being forced to choose two standard deviations from the mean on both sides. And it just seems really unfair. And so understanding purple, I mean, having grown up in, in purple, these are not bad people. These are not racist people. These are not, that are voting, um, you know, the way that they are, it's just, I think they feel like they have no choice. And there isn't really a choice. Yeah. And I can uh, add to that, that they are not bad people. Here are still purple people around. I live in Italy, in the countryside. And uh, for instance, my plumber or other people who come sometimes to work for me, you know, you can trust them, absolutely. They are uh, heart, heartful people and they are honest mm -hmm. and they try to do their best. They have a little bit, you know, they believe in what they listen, see in the television and they, you cannot mm -hmm. really talk with them about arguments because they, they don't have the capacity yet, I would say, what we have maybe in blue, orange to, to, to for thought process, you know, cause, uh, cause and effect and uh, these things, logical uh, development of thought. That's more difficult for them. I, I see that. But as people, they are great. And I mm -hmm. think they are happy in many ways. Because as soon as you go into, into red, where you are, become more greedy, when you are going the negative uh, part of red, this um, goes away. And I know some people in red too. And it's less fun to be with them because they are looking on the, on the money, on every little thing, while the others, this, um, my plumber, for instance, I often, he asks so little money. I say, you, you need to ask more money for that. It's your time, it's your work, you know? But no, they want to give and they want to, to you know, for them the, to be here, he has never time. But when he is here, he is talking all the time and it's, it's fun, you know? <laughs> So it's difficult to get him here, but for him to talk with his clients is yeah. important, you know? And so I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the purple way. And I'm sad that it is going away in our countries, you know? Mm -hmm. it's overlain by the greedy part now. Maybe that's different in America because as I have understood in America, the the land is so much bigger. So the distances are so much bigger. I'm here in the countryside, but the next city is, I mean, I go to Rome in, in an hour and I have the next city where are concerts and everything in, in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So you are much more in contact with uh, normal life, let's say, you know. Yeah, yeah and I, I think here, you know, something, something that you said about um, maybe not able to go to the next level or something, I guess that's the part that I might debate a little bit in the, the spiral theory that I think, I mean, the purples that I know, it's really a choice. I mean, they, um, I, I don't think it's that they don't understand, I mean, for some of them, what's out there or what, I, I think that they find great meaning being connected to the land and connected to their families the way they are. And I don't think it's at all, um, I mean, that's where it gets a little bit complicated between the academic side and just the pure worldview side. You know, I think that um, their capabilities are really boundless. It's just sort of a matter of where they find meaning and that there is no, that sort of cataclysmic event to, to make a change happen. It's not that they're not academically capable or not, you know, it's just that I think that they have meaning where they are and there's no reason to change. And frankly, I think that's, um, 
that's a lot of um, what is valuable about the rural areas is, um, is that folks find meaning in what they do. And I don't know that we want to change that. I mean, I guess I don't, I don't look at the statistics and think, gosh, I really wish the world were less than 65% purple. I think maybe it's just sort of why, in, in a way, I mean, can, can we let purple just be purple? I mean, if now there, I think, then you get into the issue of someone who was raised into a purple family who, who wants to be something else. I think that's, that's the issue that I'm really fascinated with. How do we support purples who want to do something else, who want to be something else and who want to move out of purple because their own purple family is probably not going to support them that much. So I think the rest of the world, that's where we could get great leadership is these purples who, who work hard and who are, you know, trustworthy. And when you sort of look at the box of what people need in world leaders, like they are all of those things, we just may never see them because they may be stuck in purple forever. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking about um, how is it then when say when somebody wants to go and do something else and doesn't get enough support. I mean, um, that's also when people are not in purple that they are not necessarily getting support from for the, from their families when when you do something else than was planned for you. No, that's also in blue. Uh, when you get out of the family idea. But what I'm interested in is what you said about the meaning, finding meaning. And I can so agree with mm -hmm. uh, being in the countryside. When I came here to Italy, I live in the countryside for, the, for five years. I was only here doing sort of uh, organic farming, sort of. I tried to, you know, error, <laughs> trial and error thing. But I enjoyed it so much to be with nature. And now when I so much on the, on the internet, uh, as soon as I go out and cut a little bit away thorns or cut on roses or do something else, get some weed out or so, because I have reduced my, my agriculture completely. But this is then when I find again, a sort of, of different joy. It's sort of inside, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, probably what you feel when you go on, on your horse, you know. So exactly. the, yeah. the question of meaning is important. And it seems to me that in purple, the meaning is sort of immediate. You still have a complete connection with what is meaningful for you. And the, the, the nature, you can watch nature and have joy on that, you know. Yeah, you can see, I mean, it's sort of the old fruits of your labor adage. I mean, it's, it's right there. You see it every day, the results. I mean, the results are immediate. The tasks, you can go and complete a task and you can see the result and it's so rewarding. And I think that's, that's maybe somewhat what we've lost by moving away from the land and having... I mean, if you're in a, you know, you're in an orange pursuit or, or if you're an angsty yellow, I mean, there's really not, not a lot that's that rewarding. You kind of have to find meaning in the challenge. And, and I think just kind of moving up through, you know, especially like the greens and oranges, I think it's just like the, the actual feelings of accomplishment. It, I think it takes more, right? And I think that's the great thing about purple is that um, there's a lot of stress that goes with it, but there's also this, you can just look out at your land and there's an immediate gratification. And I, I guess I, 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 wanna, I want to learn more about where purple is going and what's happening with purple, but I, I guess I, I think there's so many good things about purple. Actually, I do think it is. And you know, uh, when, we were in South Africa when I talked with Rika and she said to somebody, I don't know, maybe to Lorraine, you are, you are purple, you are purple. And I realized that in our integral communities that would have been a, a blame or, a, a, you know, mm -hmm. something 
you should be better, you know. So mm -hmm. I realized that we in our academic thinking, uh, thinking that is a vertical progression in the spiral, that we have um, connected with it a value of, you know, growth and better. So when she said that you are purple and then mm -hmm. was so normal and she said, yeah, you are purple. And in the next moment you can be green. In the next moment you can be beige or something. And that made me understand how much in our sort of academic thoughts, we are away from, from reality and that all these lower stages of development are living in us. And when we uh, cultivate them, we could have the benefit of it. But I think in our cultures here, where I lived, uh, where I had connections, we didn't value purple enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, So Heidi, do you think that when you went back to your farm that you were trying to find your purple? Is that, is that what was happening for you personally? You know, I never had a farm before. I had only a garden. I grew up in a family. My mother worked hard in a garden, uh, in a vegetable garden, and we had to weed and help, and I never liked it. But as soon as I went to Berlin and lived in Berlin for studying, then we had a holiday house outside in, in West Germany. It was West Germany then. Um, and there, every time I arrived, I wanted to see what has grown in my little garden. So there was this, this idea in, in, of, of fascinating, of, of the growth, that you can observe the growth of plants and so on. No? And when I came here in this house, and I could stay all the time here because I had a person who was uh, a partner who was financing the whole thing, so I didn't have to work. I really enjoyed it to try out and even with animals, I had sheep and I had all sorts of uh, chicken and geese and you know, whatever. Uh, only horses not because I'm with fearful of high animals. <laughs> <laughs> It's well, not... maybe, maybe we can change that. We'll, we'll bring you to Montana and conquer your fear. Okay. <laughs> no, but they also said it's not a good uh, place here because a person had his horse for a while here, but it is too hilly. And he said the horses need mm -hmm. um, even ground to, to, to live well. So mm -hmm. anyway, but this is a rationalization anyway. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. <laughs> with nature, with the animals, and curious I, to observe them. And to, that is a, a happiness, which is, it is a lot of work. I mean, I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and went to bed at nine or 10, uh, exhausted, because you have to do so many things, you know, when you have a lot of, and I did it all alone, more or less. But it was satisfying, and it was, mm -hmm. A tiredness which is different than sitting a whole day on the computer you know mm -hmm. it's a tiredness with this what you said the satisfaction of having seen something having accomplished something having also helped uh, the plants to grow for instance you have to, to water in summer every day you cannot just say oh this morning I want to sleep you know no you have to go and do that it's a sort of a slavery, but at the other hand, it makes you proud that you can do that and that you have managed to, to grow this vegetable instead of uh, having it dead when, with the heat, you know, and, and it is great. It's great. <laughs> yeah, but it, it does. I mean, I think that the, you know, if, if you want to look at second tier or whatever, I mean, I, I think there's so many people that um, that want nothing more than to go back to purple. I, I, we see it all the time here. People who who burn out. I mean, if you want to use the phrase burnout or or whatever, just finally decide. You know, what's the purpose of all of it? And I think that's the glory of purple is that there's always a purpose. I mean, I don't know any. I mean, in in the purple rancher community that I know, I mean, I don't know anyone that, that burns out. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, it, they have meaning. They have meaning every day. I mean, people might not make it financially. They might um, get in a position where they're not physically capable anymore. But I think this whole idea that we're going for some 
upper level thing doing academic pursuits or whatever, I mean, maybe the joke's on all of us, frankly, because um, if you're looking for meaning, I mean, it's, you just sort of go drive through the rural part of, you could drive through Bavaria, you could drive through rural Montana, and you would see the same type of people. I mean, through South Africa, I mean, I think people are largely the same everywhere. And I think those that have this purple meaning in their life, I mean, I guess I would just posit, maybe they don't need to go looking for anything else. Mm -hmm. So what would you say? You have now done the, the step out of purple in a certain sense. How do you preserve your purple? Yeah, it's hard because I think there's a, it's, it's, I really like the spiral theory because it helps alleviate the guilt a little bit. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of guilt if you come from deeply purple because your first duty is, is to the family, right? It's to the ranch. And I mean, now I have a corporate job. I have twin babies that are 15 months old. I have a little boy. I have a husband. I, I mean, I have, you know, all these other sort of normal life things. And yet I still, like every day I'll think, well, gosh, I wonder if my dad's doing okay with X task, right? I mean, does he need help doing X, Y, or Z? And I'm not really in a position, like I'm always offering, but I'm not really in a position from a time perspective where I can go do a lot that's helpful. But I think just understanding the spiral part of it is helpful because I've, I've always worried with my own kids I, I want, I mean, I feel so lucky to have this work ethic and this sort of view that any other job that I do will be easy. And this just sort of underlying, like whatever happens, you'll survive it. It doesn't really matter what it is because you've survived significant and difficult things. And I think, gosh, how am I going to give that to my kids? And I've kind of felt like I don't know how to do that. And then I finally realized I'm, I'm not purple. So, I mean, I have a lot of purple. And I can go be purple when I'm with my family, but I guess I'm not. And my kids are not going to grow up in a purple family because we're not purple. So it's like a brave new world. And I guess I've just kind of stopped where, I mean, I, I make sure that they spend a ton of time with my family so that they get their purple. And I have an amazing nanny who is like the most glorious of purple ever. So, but I, I just kind of stopped thinking you can replicate, you know, that I can replicate my own, childhood or something because my kids just won't grow up purple and they'll be totally different and who knows what'll happen i mean i i don't know how they'll turn out and how it will affect them and you know i mean it but it, i can't wish that i can't try to give them purple because i mean i can put elements of purple in but i'm i'm just not deeply purple anymore yeah. if i ever was so i guess I've, i think i think that understanding it the worldview system academically Maybe it's just alleviated a certain amount of guilt. <laughs> yeah, because, I don't know. because uh, as we need to understand the beauty of purple we need, and the, the, the importance, so we need also to understand the beauty and the importance of the other levels. And if you that's now right. no, are part of the other level, that's good too. That's where you are and not being guilt that you are not anymore... Uh, in another and you might even jump somewhere else you know that's that's exactly. the beauty in in human life we never know <laughs> where we can arrive yeah, in our opening think, no that's, yeah it is and i think that's the the glory of of you know sort of i mean my kids will be whoever they want to be and maybe they'll end up being you know end up running the ranch and, and going back and doing all the things my father wished I would have done. But I guess I can't, um, I think, I think the one thing I can do for them is just let them be who they are. I mean, not force them into, you know, and I guess that's the thing um, that I, I'm interested in studying is how you can give people in purple families who, you know, I was lucky and had, I had links to the outside world and, had the opportunity to do other things, but the families who maybe poverty is too big of a, a barrier or they just never get the, you know, the luck of having a different life show up for them. 
I guess I'm interested in how do we support those people just because it's such a huge percentage of the world and I think they really do have the characteristics that you really need in, in leaders. So I'm just interested in how you, how you go and pull the people out of purple families who could do a lot of good but may never get to a more public setting. I now had an idea because as I got to know uh, gardening because my mother was doing it, but I really didn't do it at the beginning and then I did it. But from a different perspective, when you give the opportunity to your children to get to know this other life and maybe one of them or who knows will decide to go back to this reality, but that will be from a different level. And so uh, maybe mm -hmm. that can ripple out to, to the other people who have themselves not the opportunity of uh, going somewhere, but knowing people from, who are in the same surrounding, the same uh, work, let's say, in the same, uh, but having a different mindset, that might, I really think it will slowly um, transport itself mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to an opening everywhere. And then you, as you said, you, they always have the choice if they want to stay there or not. And we don't necessarily uh, need everybody in, you know, in yellow or turquoise. We need enough people and especially the leaders in the higher stages of development, mm -hmm. you know. And so your inquiry is, is uh, really important. How do we get the wisdom, the innate wisdom incorporated in people who by their academic uh, orientation have lost that and mm -hmm. become complete leaders. I know there's a lot of, of, of attempt to do that, but you know, we see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then, then I think the key too is having leaders who who don't take advantage of purple, right? And I, I think that maybe it's just a risk. I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe the other colors are at the same risk, but I, I guess I would say purple would be especially susceptible because it's a patriarchal setting, right? So it's it's easy to come in as a as a patriarch and sort of um, prey on purple. And I think it's probably easier to do that than blue or green or, you know, I mean, I just, I think that um, that's the other difficult thing is that then if, if leaders prey on purple, it's sort of like a, a double whammy, right? I mean, <laughs> the people who shouldn't be stuck in purple are stuck in purple, plus everyone's being preyed on by someone who's red. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, I think it has this commitment from leaders also to, you know, I think purple comes in masses and I think it's pretty, it's pretty easy to just take advantage of that. So that's the other thing that I think everyone just has to commit to, but easier said than done. <laughs> So how would you see the, the future of, of purple and the power of purple to change something f towards the good? I mean, especially, especially in your country. What could well, they do? I, mean, I think, honestly, the, the thing about purple is, is like the loyalty and the, if we just had a, a leader who who wanted to do good for purple. I mean, I, I think that that would be half of the battle, right? Is allowing, I mean, I think the difficult thing in the US is our two party system. It's choosing between two, I think most Americans would say not desirable choices. And we're forced to make that choice. And really, as long as it's about funding and finances, just, you know, I think that there is a great opportunity for, for someone who really um, understands the rural side of America and to, to step up into leadership and actually have a voice for people. And I think there's so many collaborative things that can be done from, you know, because we have these issues of the environment versus the economics of rural America and people make their, making their livings off the environment and you know, others wanting 
um, to make sure that it's properly regulated. And I just, I think if people could actually have these conversations rather than being forced into a two party system, I think there's tons of room for collaborating. I really do. Mm -hmm. And change the two party system, it's hard. Yeah. How to change that? It's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We, we don't know it here, you know, we have many parties in Italy, sometimes we have 30 parties and that's too much, definitely. <laughs> but two parties is just, you, you have to choose between the, the bad and the worse, you know, instead of finding an alternative. That's really, really, really a problem. Oh dear, yeah. So in your <laughs> idea is if the leader was wise, Mm -hmm. and probably highly developed, higher developed than just red and making deals, uh, and even higher as than blue and, and orange, because blue- I think it's really, I mean, I think to really, and again, this is kind of my non-academic take, Heidi, I, I think to really do purple justice, it has to be someone who is a second tier thinker. Exactly. Because I think otherwise they don't understand purple. They they put purple in a, a bucket of undeveloped. And that's yeah. not true at all. I mean, that's, I think it is, it is absolutely untrue to assume that purples are of less academic um, capability than the other colors. I, I think there is brilliance there. They just have already found meaning at the level they're at. So yeah, I mean, I think... It can't be one of the other first tier colors because I don't think by definition they could ever understand what purple's really doing and why they're doing it. Yeah, yeah that uh, I agree totally because I think what, what I try to do in my little surrounding here is to, to, to inspire people to step up and get, get into 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 second tier because in first tier we won't we won't find the solutions and i'm glad that many many people are trying to with leadership courses and and opening the minds of let's say traditional leaders and 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 bring them up for me the solution or let's say saving of the world is in that that enough people are knowledgeable enough and wise enough that means uh, get together their heads and their hearts and from there are able to decide uh, the things which are important and not just from their heads and from the, or from their, uh, where does greed sit? I don't know. It's not in the heart. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it really is just, um, is the worldview of, of wanting a better world, right? I mean, it's that sort of second tier, not just a better. I think that that, just, I, again, just to go back to purple, I mean, I think that that value system is so accurate for sort of world betterment. It's just that it, it can't really think outside its own community or family structure, but I think the right person who who understands that, but also has the second tier capabilities to explain it to, you know, I mean, to, to get others on board. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's where it's at. I just, I guess I, as we've been talking, I mean, I think it would be, um, I think all of the brilliance lies in purple. It's just a matter of interpreting it and then getting someone to make it happen. And that's the piece, like you're saying, I mean, getting someone to stand up and sort of take action, I don't really see someone in purple doing that because they don't. I mean, they're, they, they don't, I mean, they're not the patriarch, right? Unless they're the patriarch and then I would assume they would have to go to red, mm -hmm. right? So I, I just think by definition, it's got to be someone who has the best interests of purple in their, you know, in their interests. Their goal is to make life as good as possible for purple. But, you know, it's just that it's a matter of matching that, that will up with that capability. And you know, it's, it's probably not that large of a cross section of people, frankly. <laughs> I was thinking about the spiral that's uh, saying that in second tier we are returning into 
beige and then purple, we call it now mm -hmm. yellow and uh, turquoise, but it's more or less the same uh, fundamental uh, ca uh, capacities which uh, appear. So we need to, to have purple leaders in second tier, you know, because we need to expand what you mm -hmm. said in purple, you are a patriarch, patriarch but in your family. And we need to uh, have patriarchs, patriarchs mm -hmm. which can also be matriarchs then, but not only for the family, but mm -hmm. see the whole world as the family, the human family. And then it's exactly what, what we need. When we understand that the whole world, mm -hmm. all humans are the family, we have to take care for, and there must be a, a wise person uh, leading and the others are loyal to that person, which can also change then, you know, but always uh, a, a figure there who is giving the inspiration, let's say, um, then, then we could resolve the problems. You know, I always say, I, <laughs> that's a little bit, you know, uh, dramatic, but I say that the best system for the present problems of the world is not democracy, but it would be a, <clears throat> a, a wise leader, a wise mm -hmm. absolute leader who is doing the right things, you know, and, and that would be purple, mm -hmm. the, the purple principle, because with democracy, yeah. we are a little bit too, too scattered, you know, we never come to a decision, but when the... Wait, I think you're, you're choosing... Yeah, you're kind of choosing between poor alternatives and sometimes in democracy. Yeah. And uh, I mean, a sort of uh, absolute leadership is bad when the leader is, is bad, you know. But if it is a real inter, in, inter, a person with integrity and a person with a, a, a really good heart and an understanding of, of you know, wanting to, to good, do good for the world and having enough knowledge about everything and being open and understanding. It's a, but he can do what he feels is right. Seems to be a better idea than a democratic process which takes 20 years to come to a decision, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I think there's so much merit to that. And maybe at the end of the day, she can do what she thinks is right. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that is just a little bit out of my, out of my head, which is not very popular probably. Oh, my doggy is complaining. <laughs> Love it. But oh yay! <laughs> that would, would mean I'm just jealous that your dog is at work with you, Heidi. <laughs> Yeah, incorporate purple values in our mindset. I, I, that's that's what I mean when I say this thing about politics. You know, uh, we need to come back to to a purple way of appreciation of of. Yeah. Well, I I think just the way that purple cares for its community is just profound to me. I mean, the things that. Um, I think what strikes me about my family so much is how much they care about their friends and the length that they will go to take care of their community. It's just astounding. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's just, it really is an extended family. And I think if you, I, I mean, it sounds corny, but that's, I think the magic elixir is translating that feeling of community and that someone will truly drop everything they're doing for someone who's not a family member and frankly may not even be that close of a friend but they're part of the community and they're in need and i think that's the magic elixir i mean that's and and that's why i think purple is more purple is more valuable than some of the other colors because it it creates such a bond and i think that's what we're missing right now from humanity's standpoint, is really that bond and the reason to care about either. We have totally lost that, and we need in some way to revive mm -hmm. it. As as I said before, on the higher spiral turning, that would be mm -hmm. absolutely great. So you know, I'm I'm amazed about about that. I didn't I didn't know. I don't know much about America. I got to know a little bit by Mark. He was American, but he was from uh, Illinois. Uh, so probably far away from the places you are. 
and uh, I didn't get a lot of uh, understanding of America. So you helped me to understand the new part of it, and that's really great. Thank you for that. Well, now, now you have to come and see it, Heidi. Right now, now you have to come and visit and see it for yourself. It's an academic quest. You, you, I mean, you have to probably immerse and study for at least a few months, right? Okay, if I if I can, I I try to sell my house here, and then <laughs> I come and sit on your horses. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we will see what comes out of it. Anyway, I thank you very much for that conversation. And uh, when you are uh, further, when you have further ideas, I would love to talk again with you. Okay. And see you. See you very soon. I would love to. I'm amazed. It's just, I'm really honored. Thank you. <laughs> thank you too. Bye-bye.